So today is uh, medical surveillance, and anybody that's been to any of my other seminar series know I like to try and do a joke at the start. I couldn't find a joke for uh, medical surveillance, so I'll just give you my general joke. Uh, the owner of a drugstore walks in to find a guy leaning heavily against uh, the wall. The owner asks the clerk, what's with that guy over there by the wall? The clerk says, well, he came in here this morning for a cough. I couldn't find the cough syrup, so I gave him an entire bottle of laxative. And the uh, drugstore owner says, you idiot, you can't treat a cough with a laxative. And the clerk replies, of course you can. Look at him. He's too afraid to cough. <laughs> so it's the best I got. OK, so medical examinations uh, and clinical tests that are required by law when a worker is exposed to designated substances. Uh, this is what medical surveillance is all about. We at the clinic offer uh, medical surveillance for the designated substances. Most of the time, we do isocyanates, uh, silica, and lead, and some asbestos. Um, but we can do all the other ones, but those are the main ones that we do here in Windsor. Um, we also offer hygiene, ergonomic, uh, patient visits, presentations, and those are all free. There is a charge for medical surveillance. And the charges vary depending on what substance we're talking about because there's uh, different costs for the different tests. So our rates are based on what those tests cost us to have done. So if you want to know for a specific chemical what it would cost to have us do the medical surveillance, I suggest you give me a call and I'll quote you a price. Um, medical surveillance serves as a backup for engineering and work practice controls. What this means is if we identify um, somebody who may have a problem uh, related to one of the chemicals, this may mean that you have a problem uh, as far as your engineering practices go in controlling that substance. So it would be uh, an indicator for you to look at your process, to look at your hygiene controls, to look at what's going on. Uh, it's alert for potential problems, same thing as the other one. It allows for action to be taken to protect an individual worker. For chemicals like isocyanates, if we can catch the problem early enough, if somebody starts to develop breathing problems and we can remove them from the exposure, uh, we stand a good chance of preventing them from developing asthma, which is one of the common problems for isocyanates. Uh, medical surveillance was one of the first uh, worker health strategies started in the early 19th century along with workplace inspections by the government. Medical surveillance is also voluntary by the worker. Uh, the worker can choose to participate or choose not to participate and all the costs for it are paid by the company. Um, some of the problems I have with the voluntary by the worker is it allows uh, the employer to put some pressure on a worker to say, you know, uh, it costs us a certain amount of money, you know, maybe if you say no, things would go better. It also uh, allows the worker to refuse because some workers are afraid, what if I get found not fit? Um, generally on a medical surveillance program, there's three things that you can be found, and I'll talk about them next. That uh, the physician only discloses to the employer that whether the worker's fit, unfit, or fit with restrictions. They can't uh, disclose any of the test results. They can't re disclose any of the other health information. So sometimes a worker uh, may not want to participate because they're afraid to be found unfit and afraid they'll lose their job. Uh, if they can't do their, if they're a painter, we tell them they can't be exposed to isocyanates, and then pretty much they can't be a painter, so they're very worried about keeping their job. So sometimes their health issues get put behind. Uh, the records also must be kept for 40 years, so anybody that wants to do medical surveillance, any kind of clinic or doctor that wants to get involved in it, has to realize that they have an obligation to keep the records for 40 years. If they close up their practices, they can send the, uh, all the records into the Ministry of Labor. Um, but it's one of the commitments that you have to be willing to, to make. So that's one of the commitments we have made arrangements for here to keep the records for 40 years. And the worker can also receive results uh, if they give their consent. And I would suggest to anybody that has medical surveillance or anybody that's involved in it as a worker, ask for your test results, keep your own test results, keep your own fit reports. It's just good for your own records. When we do it here, uh, the breathing tests mostly, we always give a copy to the worker of the breathing test, copy of the fit report to the, to the worker. Some of the typical things you'll find on a medical surveillance form. Um, this is a questionnaire that has to be done with pretty much every chemical. All uh, 12 designated regulations require a uh, questionnaire. The timing of the questionnaire varies depending on the chemical. Usually the average is six months to a year where you have to fill out the questionnaire. Uh, some of the areas that you have to have in the questionnaire, obviously you need the name of the worker, maiden name of the mother. I think that's mostly for tracking reasons. Uh, I know it's a question a lot of times people say, well, why do I have to give that? It's for tracking. Same thing as social insurance number because there may be two people with the same name. It's all it's just another way to identify you. Date of birth, uh, occupation or job title, when you started working, 
when you stopped working operations or processes where you're involved with the designated substance. Uh, we need to know how your plant is using that substance, how you're being exposed to it. Uh, if you have the concentration of the exposure, a lot of times that's difficult for us to get. Um, they're supposed to be doing the measuring. Sometimes they don't. The Ministry of Labor only has so many inspectors, so they can't get everywhere. A lot of the small little mom and pop shops are not going to do the measuring. Um, they should, but I think that's much more costly than the medical surveillance part. Maybe Barry can answer that. Probably costs a lot of money to send in one of those hygienists. Uh, protective equipment. We need to know what kind of protective equipment the worker's wearing. If they have to wear uh, breathing equipment, even if they're wearing gloves, coveralls. One of the big suggestions I always make to people is, you know, use the coveralls, use the uh, overcoats that your uh, employer provides, and don't wash your clothes when you come home with your family's clothes. Uh, I don't care where you're working. Why do that? Just keep your clothes separate. Do your clothes in your own washing machine. We all know the stories about asbestos when they didn't know. Uh, asbestos caused all those bad diseases. Um, wives were at home taking their husband's clothes, shaking them out, washing them. And they were developing mesothelioma, uh, lung cancer, and various other things. So because we don't know about all the chemicals, keep them separate, wash them in their own cycles, do their own thing. Um, also, we need to know about doctor's visits. Sometimes some of your other problems with diabetes, other health issues that the worker might have, have an effect on uh, some of the chemicals they're being exposed to. So we need to know about that. Any examinations or reports they've had done in the past. If you've just had a chest x-ray, there's no point in us doing another one right away. Um, these ones on the questionnaire and as part of the worker's file are more specific um, towards the chemicals. So the health assessment would be more geared uh, with questions towards which chemical we're talking about. Each chemical has its own health effects. Um, so you have to know what you're talking about to be able to ask the right questions. Any of the test results that we do, uh, any of the breathing tests, any of the blood tests we do, any referral letters, if we referred you to a specialist, if we've identified any other problems, we need to do that. I feel like I'm just talking and talking. Um, the WSOB form number sevens and number eights. Um, if we identify a problem, we need to fill out, the doctor has to fill out the compensation forms. Uh, that's also in the law, so it's not just an option. The doctor does have to fill out the uh, workers' compensation forms. Any other health information that you have, any of the actions that were taken, and they qualify actions as the fit reports, the unfit report, or uh, any specialist tests you have to be sent for. That all has to be in the file. We also generally request uh, that we get a worksite visit to any place we do medical surveillance. It's much easier for us to talk to workers and understand what they're doing and what the process is if we were able to see the process in action. Uh, it's really hard to sit here and have somebody tell you what they do. It's much easier if you can go see it. So it's usually one of our requirements that we get a worksite visit. It's not by law, but it's my law. Okay, the purpose of medical surveillance, uh, to develop a baseline. It's very important. To, um, to get a baseline on a worker before they're exposed. Uh, it's hard to notice breathing changes if we don't know the way you were before you went in. So it's very important that we get a baseline on everybody. So important we see people before they start uh, working with the different chemicals. This is probably one of the, uh, the areas we get the least success in because most of the time people that are here for the medical surveillance because the company got the Ministry of Labor came in for some reason, found out they were working with a designated substance, wrote them an order and said they had to have medical surveillance. So then the workers have already been working for five or ten years with whatever chemical before they end up here. It would be great if we could get, when the company starts up, they get involved in this, but it's usually one of the, a low priority of the health and safety. It doesn't come up till later. Uh, purpose is to detect problems early with the workers. Like I said, for isocyanates, we can help prevent asthma, um, and it's reversible. Also, one of the purposes is to file a WSIB claim if we need. And one of the big areas where the clinic emphasizes is health education. Um, sometimes if you go with these uh, places that come in and do it on a fee uh, basis service, um, they have to get X number of people through the system to be able to make their profit margin so they don't have a lot of time to talk about health education. Here at the clinic we have the freedom to spend as much time as we need with each person uh, so we can go over a range of uh, problems and a range of things that they can be doing to help themselves. 
Medical surveillance again includes pre-employment, pre-placement medical exams, periodic medical exams. Uh, these vary based on um, the chemical, depending on how often we have to do it, health education and record keeping. Okay, medical surveillance, are specific tests and regulations for medical surveillance can be found in the regulations for the 11 designated substances. I know I said there's 12 designated regulations. There's 12 regulations, but there's 11 substances. Uh, asbestos is covered twice. Asbestos is separated into construction projects because um, people working on construction projects are doing the worst thing you can do with asbestos. They're disturbing it and they're working with it, so their concentrations are a lot higher, so they have a lot more specific regulations that you have to follow if you're in the construction industry working with asbestos. And this is the definition from the Ministry of Labor on designated substances, a biological, chemical, or physical agent, or any combination of these to which a worker is exposed is prohibited, regulated, restricted, limited, or controlled. Now, I don't know where they got this definition from because to me, you know, you're talking about ergonomics. There's no ergonomic regulations. I'm sure you guys would like it if that was true. But, uh, so I think it's just maybe for legal purposes for them to cover their butt. There are 12 designated substance regulations covering 11 designated substances under the Act. Copies of the Act uh, can be purchased at the Ministry of Labor offices. They can also be purchased at WOHIS over here. So anybody that has any of these designated substances, I would suggest uh, you at least get two copies for each member of the Joint Health and Safety Committee, one for management, one for union side. Uh, if you have these substances, you, you, you better buy a copy. And here's the substances. Now I got a little contest, and everybody who works here is excluded. Whoever can find the spelling mistake wins a prize. So for the outside people, I'll give you a second and I can take a break. What happened was I burned my disc, but I noticed the mistake. I didn't want to burn another disc, so I thought I'd make a game out of it. Anybody? You're not eligible. Anybody from here is not eligible. <laughs> Take your time, because I need a break anyways. Yeah. Ah, she got it. Yeah. Ethylene is spelt wrong. So here's your prize. <laughs> so we have a list of all the chemicals here. Acrylonitrile, arsenic, I'm not going to read them all to you, um, but I am going to go into each one in the rest of the presentation. Uh, in the 1990s, um, the government and some people were questioning the validity of continuing uh, medical surveillance, whether it was doing what it was supposed to do. Some of the criteria they were using um, is that the medical surveillance had to be able to identify a problem uh, quick enough in somebody, a health effect, uh, and be able to fix it or prevent it. So that was one of their criteria when they looked. Uh, they found that medical surveillance should continue for isocyanates, lead, mercury, and silica, that those four were uh, for sure medical surveillance was successful in looking at those four. And the other ones, they were 50-50 on whether medical surveillance was uh, any use um, in doing what it was supposed to do. But the regulation stayed, so we do have the regulation, so if you do have those substances, you can't get out of doing it. Yep. Can you go through as you go and kind of outline where you might find each? Yep, that's what I'm doing next. Okay. For as much as I know. Some of them I don't know a lot about because I don't deal with them a lot. Uh, first designated substance is acrylonitrile, and it's released in the environment primarily from chemical production. And uh, I'll read it to you here. Acrylonitrile is a man-made chemical with a sharp onion or garlic-like odor. Acrylonitrile is used to make other chemicals such as plastics, rubber, acrylic fibers. Acrylonitrile is used to make acrylic fiber for clothing, blankets, carpeting, and other fabrics. Rugged plastics for computer, TV housings, and nitrile rubber for oil-resistant hoses used in the automotive sector as well as at gasoline stations. So just because it's in all those chemicals doesn't mean that the general public has to worry about it when you purchase these chemicals. This is more for the people that are involved in the manufacture of these chemicals, uh, these products. Um, so if you're using your vacuum cleaner, it's cured by then and it's fine. So you don't have to worry about the release of acrylonitrile. It's only for the people that are in the production of these that they would have a worry. Uh, acrylonitrile has not been produced in Canada since 1972. It is totally imported from the U.S. And just a picture of some of the chemicals, some piping, vacuum cleaner, uh, suitcases, briefcases, and that's an automotive wing, I think they call it, for your car. These are just some of the examples of acrylonitrile. 
some of the health problems with acrylonitrile. nitrile. All of these chemicals have very serious health problems. Um, cancer being involved in almost all of them. Some of the data is questionable on cancer for certain ones of them, but cancer is involved in almost all the chemicals. Uh, if they weren't serious health effects, they wouldn't have been regulated by the Ministry of Labor. So uh, if you are involved with them, anybody watching anywhere can contact the clinic and make sure you do get medical surveillance. It's very important that you get it. Uh, don't listen to anybody who tells you it's okay, you know, you'll be fine, whatever else. Make sure you get the medical surveillance. So acrylonitrile is a skin and respiratory and severe eye irritant. Breathing high concentrations can cause nose and throat irritation, chest tightness, difficulty breathing, nausea, dizziness, weakness, headache. Uh, at higher concentrations, damages the red blood cells and the liver. And uh, may also cause lung cancer. And it can cause tumors in the brain, salivary glands, intestines, and it may cause birth defects. Some of the clinical tests that we can do for acrylonitrile. I have a whole long thing about it, but I'll cut it back a little bit. We do liver function tests. Uh, we do different urine and blood tests, um, but they're also, some of those tests are affected by cigarette smoke, so that's why the health history is very important. Uh, if you smoke, some of your acrylonitrile levels will be up, uh, some of your liver function tests will be up, because cigarette smoke, uh, should I give my little speech about not smoking? It's going to come up in almost all the chemicals. Uh, a cigarette has almost all of these chemicals in it, so remember that when you're having your cigarette, acrylonitrile, arsenic, they mix lots of benzene, lots of stuff in your cigarette. Um, we also do x-rays, acrylonitrile absorption tests. Um, because it's absorbed by the body, we look for uh, some of the metabolites, some of the products that it produces, that the body produces when it's absorbing the acrylonitrile. And one of the big things we're also looking for in this uh, is colorectal cancer. So it's important with the health assessment to understand some of those health problems so you're asking the right questions, you know, how are they going to the bathroom and things like that. Um, and uh, that's it for that, I guess. We also do, the big part for health education for this is to wash uh, before you go and drink or smoke. Make sure you keep your personal hygiene up. Arsenic. Arsenic is a naturally occurring element widely distributed in the Earth's crust. Arsenic is an element that is used with other metals to make hard, strong, and corrosion resistant alloys. Arsenic compounds are found in pigments, animal poisons, insecticides, paints, wallpaper, ceramics, and poison gases for chemical warfare. Uh, most of the occupational exposure comes from copper or lead smelting. Uh, <coughs> wood pressure treating is found in, uh, arsenic is found in there. It's also found with people using pesticides. Uh, sawing or sanding or burning arsenic-treated wood. Barry and I had a lady who had an arsenic problem at her house, uh, and they had a uh, pressure-treated deck that was running off into the garden, running off into the pool. So we thought that may be one of the causes, and a neighbor was also burning, probably burning pressure-treated wood. I think he was going to let us into his yard, so. Arsenic is uh, present in gold and base metal processing, use of pesticides containing arsenic, coal-fired power generating stations, and here's some of the substances. There's the pressure-treated wood, a guy spraying whatever, and batteries. That was the big thing I found when I was doing this presentation. I would not want to work in a battery plant because <laughs> batteries also <laughs> seem to contain all these chemicals for some reason. Uh, inorganic arsenic has been consistently demonstrated to cause cancer in humans, both by uh, breathing it in and eating it. Arsenic poisoning does cause a variety of symptoms, uh, muscle spasm, nausea, vomiting, uh, myriad of symptoms. So that's why it's also important I'm going again over the questionnaire and the health effects. A lot of times people will have a lot of these symptoms, you know, just with the flu or other things. So it's important for us to know how you're exposed, when you were exposed, to be able to make some kind of relationship to your work and not just you having the flu. Uh, some of the clinical tests that you can do with arsenic are urine and uh, hair and fingernail testing. Um, there's pros and cons with using each one. Um, urine only measures arsenic that's been in your body for the last few days. Uh, hair and fingernail can measure arsenic over the past 6 or 12 months. Uh, most of these tests can only tell that you've been exposed. They can't tell how much you've been exposed or what kind of problems you're going to develop. So just because we take a urine or a hair sample, we can't tell you, yes, you, you know, you've been exposed to such and such and 
you're going to develop this problem. It's just to let us know that you have been exposed. And again, that's why the worker uh, history and questionnaire is so important. Asbestos, I think most people know about asbestos by now. They've heard about it. It was a good substance when it was first uh, invented because it served its purpose well. Lucy looking at me. Uh, it was very good for, uh, it didn't get affected by temperature. Um, it was used in brake pads, used in house insulations, sprayed on insulation in buildings. So it was a good product for those uses. Uh, unfortunately, they found out later all the health problems that came with it. Asbestos is a common name for a group of naturally occurring minerals. Asbestos is a strong mineral that is resistant to heat and chemicals. It results in its use as an insulating material. Airplanes, vehicles, appliances, there's all kinds of uses. We're all exposed to asbestos probably every day um, from the degrading of products and everything else, but we're not exposed as much as somebody who has to work with it. And again, some of the products, a lot of times in the factories now, this is what we're finding wrapped around the insulation as around the pipes. And you know, it's 30 years later since it's been put up, it's all getting breakable and it's all falling off and that's where all the dangers are coming from. It's also used in brake pads, uh, again, because of its heat resistance. You know how much heat is generated when you're trying to stop your car. But at the same time, the pads being ground up, getting into the air, and that's where you get some of your exposure. Uh, and also in the mining industry, in the mining of asbestos. And there's lots of health problems that come along with asbestos. Uh, asbestosis, lung cancer, uh, mesothelioma, pleural plaques. Um, I don't know how much I'll go into this. There's tons of problems with it, for sure. Uh, I forget the question Lucy had for me. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? That was a question about that being related to it. If you have a certain uh, disease and you want to know if it was related to your asbestos exposure, I would suggest you call me and ask me to do the search. Uh, Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma I found wasn't. I didn't find any relationship. So, uh, But it is related to lots of things, lots of different cancers. Some of the clinical tests we do for asbestos, uh, chest x-rays every two years, breathing tests every year, uh, the questionnaire, usually supposed to be every six months, but a lot of that's up to the doctor discretion, so we usually do it yearly. Any questions yet that I can answer? I got lots more to go. Benzene uh, is a colorless liquid with a sweet odor. Some industries, is this the one you told me? No. Some industries that use benzene to make other chemicals, which are used to make plastics, resins, nylon, synthetic fibers. It's also used to make rubbers, lubricants, dyes, detergents, drugs, and pesticides. It's also a natural part of crude oil, uh, gasoline, and cigarette smoke. Vehicle emissions appear to be the major source of benzene release within the environment. Uh, most of the exposure is for petroleum distilleries, people that are uh, fixing your gas, making it ready for you. That's where most of the exposure for benzene comes. And that's some of the products that can be found in cigarettes. I think that's a petroleum refinery supposed to be in gasoline. Uh, some of the symptoms that it can cause, headaches, nausea, dizziness, drowsiness. It's also considered a potential ca cancer hazard, uh, usually revolving the uh, blood or bone marrow. Some of the clinical tests, we do blood tests, we do chemical exam or clinical exams. Uh, that's just a doctor physical exam. Some of the questions she'll ask related to benzene. Uh, benzene is converted in the body, so we can't take blood and see if you've been exposed to benzene. We look for some of the byproducts that the body produces when you're exposed to benzene. We look if those levels are up. Uh, liver function enzymes and different metabolites, they call them, in your blood. Coke oven emissions. One of the ones I know probably the least about. Uh, the primary use of coke or carbon is in the extraction of metals from their ores, especially in the manufacture of iron and steel. It's also used to synthesize calcium carbide and to manufacture graphite and electrodes. Uh, most of the time, if you work at a coke plant, that's where your exposure is. There's not too much exposure for other people, maybe for people that live around a coke plant, um, but generally not for anybody else. And that's just some of the plants. Some smelting processes also uh, have coke oven emissions. And that's supposed to be a coke oven. Okay, one of the main concerns with coke oven emissions is cancer. Uh, the lung, trachea, bronchus, kidney, prostate, and other sites. So we have another 
issue. Like I said, most of these chemicals have very serious health effects, otherwise they wouldn't be regulated. Some of the tests that we do for coke oven emissions, um, x-rays, breathing tests, we look at your spit, uh, they do various tests on that. Ethylene oxide. Ethylene oxide is a colorless gas with a sweet odor. It's produced in large volumes, uh, used as a chemical in the manufacture of several industrial chemicals, including textiles, detergents, foam, antifreeze, solvents. It's also used in agricultural products. It's also used as a sterilizing agent for food, spices, cosmetics, medical equipment, as well as for the sterilization of surgical tools and plastic devices uh, at the hospital. And here's a picture of a supposed to be an autoclave, and that's what they use at the hospital. They add their ethylene oxide and they heat up the ethylene oxide and the surgical equipment and sterilize it for using with somebody else. Found in antifreeze and bug spray. Oops. Uh, ethylene oxide is very toxic. Uh, it causes cancer of the stomach, pancreas, leukemia, causes Hodgkin's disease. Thought there was supposed to be another one on there. It can also cause miscarriages in women, uh, eye and skin irritation. Some of the tests that we do for ethylene oxide, blood tests, breathing tests, chest x-rays, liver function tests again. Isocyanates, this is the one that we do most of our medical surveillance here at the clinic for. And they can be found in many products. Some of the main exposures we have in Windsor are the automotive repair shops and it's also used in foam production for such things as car seats. So a place like Woodbridge Foam would be using isocyanates. And there's a car plant and a foam seat. That guy was supposed to be painting on there. But. Isocyanates have a strong irritant effect of the respiratory tract. They're also skin irritants. They're also uh, eye irritants. And I don't have asthma on there, but they cause asthma, like I said before. Um, so that's why it's important for us to understand some of the effects. It's, uh, it's no good just to ask the person about breathing problems if you don't know that isocyanates also can cause them rashes. Some of the clinical tests, uh, breathing tests, chest x-ray, usually yearly depending on your symptoms again. And if we have time, I'm going to ask for a volunteer and do a breathing test on somebody. Uh, lead is a commonly used metal in the industry and manufacturing due to its low cost and ease of use. Uh, it can be found in batteries, ammunition, solder, pipes, shields for x-rays, and uh, weights for tire balancing. Uh, usually not a problem for the general public because they're coated, but it's a problem for the guy who does the tire balancing because sometimes he has to cut them, grind them off uh, to get different amounts of weight to balance your tires. So it's... Um, most of the solder nowadays is, there's no more lead in it, but you know, some of us have solder from 25 years ago in our toolboxes. Uh, may contain solder, you should probably read it. If it does, toss it out and buy yourself some new solder. Um, it's also found in the lead aprons and of course, batteries. And somebody wanted me to mention it's found in <laughs> paints, mostly in China, I think. but it is a concern for somebody who has an old house. It, it could have been found in your paint chips. Pretty much not anymore. Some of the symptoms uh, from exposure to lead include headache, fatigue, nausea, abdominal cramps, joint pain, metallic taste in the mouth. Uh, very high exposure can cause paralysis, coma, and death, and it also can damage your brain and your kidneys. Some of the tests we do for lead are uh, blood lead levels. Um, it's also important for us to know which type of lead you're exposed to. Um, blood lead levels don't work for these two types of lead. Um, so we would have to do a urine lead test. So it's really important for us to understand which one you're exposed to. That was another thing I forgot to mention in the start, but we do ask for the MSDS sheet, material safety data sheet, related to whatever chemical you're working with. So for a situation such as this, it's no good for you to come in for a lead test if we don't have the right test for the lead you're exposed to. Mercury is a shiny silver white liquid metal used in thermometers and some electrical switches. It's found in household batteries, thermometers, found in fish, burning of fossil fuels. Uh, it's found in fluorescent tubes, found in thermometers and batteries. Uh, mercury in most forms can be highly toxic. 
and you should avoid ingesting, inhaling, or touching mercury with your skin. It causes neurological effects. Uh, also causes irritability, developmental delay, psychosis, uh, and some deaths have occurred. It also causes permanent brain damage, kidney damage. The clinical tests for mercury are blood and urine tests. And silica. Uh, it's a basic component of sand, quartz, and granite rock. To some extent, silica can be found in all of the following materials. Um, it's also found in the found oops, in the foundry here at Ford Foundry. So we do some medical surveillance for that. And that there is supposed to be a sand cast. What they do is they make the uh, mold out of sand, out of the silica sand, and then they pour the mold into it. And they knock the sand off after. So there's quite a bit of sand in uh, sand casting, so you get quite exposure to silica dust uh, by all the grinding and the chipping off of the sand. And that's supposed to be uh, silica being mined. Silicosis is the main disease we're concerned about when you're exposed to silica. Uh, and it's a chronic problem. It means it results over time, uh, resulting in disability or death. They may also develop bronchitis, scarring of their lungs, tuberculosis, and lung cancer. The clinical tests for silica are chest x-rays and breathing tests. We're almost at the end. Vinyl chloride is a colorless flame, flammable gas at normal temperatures with a mild sweet odor. It's used to make PVC plastic containers, your credit cards, and vinyl siding for houses. And there's some pictures. It's also found in uh, some of the plastic coating around different wires and sometimes in the tiles on your floors, vinyl <coughs> tiles, and it causes lots of problems. Uh, breathing very high levels can cause death. It also damages nerve and immune reactions. Other workers have developed problems with blood flow in their hands. Uh, the tips of the fingers turn white and hurt when they are in the cold. Um, something else to say. And the clinical tests are liver function tests for vinyl chloride. And we did have a, a place come in last week that met with us who provide uh, medical surveillance on a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They drive around and provide it mobile. Uh, they provide mobile medical surveillance. And he told me that there is a, a new blood test for vinyl chloride, but it's available only in the states. So they draw your blood here, and they have to sit, ship it to the states. Before, they could never measure the vinyl chloride in blood. They had to, again, measure the metabolites. But now there is a test for it in the states. And that's it for medical surveillance. The cost for medical surveillance for isocyanate, since that's the one we typically do right now, the cost is $125 for us to do it for an initial visit and $80 for the yearly follow-ups. Uh, we also offer it, like I said, for all the other substances, but you should call me for a price. <laughs>